Darkcast Network, the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. On December 21st, 2020, Trizel and Jacqueline West called 911 and reported their two adopted sons, Orn and Orson, missing. According to the Wests, the four- and three-year-old boys had been playing in the family's fenced-in yard while Trizel had been gathering wood. On one of his trips back, he noticed they were gone. An intensive search immediately commenced, but there was no sign of the boys. As the public began to hear details of the story, many came to the conclusion that Jacqueline and Trizel's stories simply didn't make any sense. Police also quickly added the parents to the top of their suspect list. Searches continued, but with no luck. Then, on March 1st, 2022, Jacqueline and Trizel West were arrested for murder. Their trial is currently underway, despite the fact that the bodies of Oren and Orson have yet to be found. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of Oren and Orson West and the trial of Trizel and Jacqueline West. I'm Coda Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us once again. Ethan is looking at me. He had no idea that we were doing this episode this week. Okay, so I'm not <laughs> losing my mind. This is an update, right? Yes, this is the third episode that we've done on Orn and Orson. Because okay. um, <laughs> you started it off like a normal episode, and I'm thinking, oh my God, has she lost her mind? Has she read so many of these cases <laughs> that she just researched and wrote a script that we've already done? Nope. They are on trial. So the trial started um, back in late March, I believe. And the prosecution just rested a few days ago. So um, I wanted to give an update and go over what has happened so far in the trial. We learned a lot. And um, yeah, so we're going to do this this week and then we're going to do another update episode talking about the defense a little bit more and then, you know, ultimately the verdict. Okay. Yeah. Cause this is a big one. I mean, this case is just absolutely heartbreaking. And, you know, so we did the original episode. It was actually our season three premiere, which came out on January 12th, 2022. And then we did another episode on March 9th of 2022 um, after Jacqueline and Trizel's arrest. So if you haven't listened to those, I would recommend doing that before you get into this one, because, you know, I'm going to give a little bit of background, but not like a whole lot. So you should definitely listen to those so you can be familiar with the case. It's one of the the um, the cases and we talked about several of them in season three where the system really failed children. And um, we definitely learn more about that failure in the evidence that's been presented so far in this trial. So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, this week. So yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. Orrin West was born on August 4th, 2016, and Orson West was born on June 11th, 2017. The boys were named Sincere with a C in classic Pettis at birth. Their mother lost custody of the boys in 2018 after Sincere was brought to the hospital with a broken and twisted femur. The pair was placed in a foster home before being placed with Jacqueline and Trizel West. And, you know, interestingly, like one thing that I read when I was researching um, the trial, which I don't recall reading explicitly when I was, you know, doing the research for the first two episodes, is that um, Classic, the younger one, they didn't necessarily suspect the parents of abusing him. They just removed him from the home because according to what, you know, CPS said, siblings get removed together. 
Yeah, I mean that's that's pretty true for for the most part. I mean the idea is that, you know, you want to keep as much of the family life intact as possible. Mm-hmm. And if abuse is occurring to one, there's potential that it could occur to the other if you remove one. So yeah, I mean generally speaking, that's that's pretty common. Yeah, so the boys did get removed together and they were put with a foster family, not the Wests. So I'm not exactly sure how long they were with this original foster family, but they were with an original foster family. But then they were placed with Jacqueline and Trizel West. Now, the Wests were an experienced foster family, having taken in many children prior to Sincere and Classic. Two of these placements had already led to adoptions. The Wests also had two biological children, so when the two toddlers joined the home, that brought the total number of children up to six. And I do believe when we were originally, you know, talking about this uh, case, for good reason, a lot of information about the West's other four children had not been released. So we knew like some were adopted, some were biological. We didn't really kind of know what or what genders they were or anything. Um, what I do know now, and again, I, I mean, I know their names, which I'm not going to say in this. Um, it's been public record now because of the trial, but I still don't think that needs to be publicized. But what I will say is that all of the children in the home were boys. So it was a total of six boys. The oldest two children were biological. The middle two children were adopted. And then Orrin and Orson, of course, were adopted as well. So when did their names change? After the adoption, I guess. I don't know exactly when. But I mean, that to me, like, I don't know. I I, I mean, I have a big problem with that as well. Like the kids weren't terribly old when that happened. I mean, they were toddlers, like maybe 18 months, two years, something around those lines. But it's like, still, they know their name, right? You know, and you're just going to rename them like you got them from the shelter, right? Like, yeah, I don't know. And, and it's tough. And I actually did struggle with that as I was writing this because it felt wrong to refer to them as Orn and Orson because, you know, given everything that's happened, I feel like it would be better to refer to them as their birth names, Sincere and Classic, but just for clarity's sake. Yeah. You know, uh, because they are referred to Orrin and Orson in the trial, and that's what we're talking about. I just felt that, you know, we kind of needed to stick with that. But yeah, I do find that challenging. So the family of eight lived in a small home in the Casa Loma Apartments in Bakersfield, California. In the spring of 2020, however, the family started making plans to move. They went under contract on a house in the desert town of California City, California, about 75 miles away. The Wests were handed the keys to their new home in September of 2020, and three months later, the boys are gone. But as details came out, many people started wondering if Sincere and Classic, now called Orn and Orson, had ever been there in the first place. According to the prosecution, at least one of them was not. One of them was not. Yeah, we're, that's exactly it. So when, if you go back to our episode about that we did after they were arrested, um, the DA in their press conference did say that they believed that the boys had been killed several months prior to the family's move to California City, um, which is something that I, you know, that was my theory when we were originally talking about this case, like I didn't think either of them had ever been there. And um, it did seem that the DA agreed. But what we've learned now from the trial, and of course, I'm going to get into it, is that the boys were not killed at the same time. Okay. Yeah. This is a heavy one this week. As the prosecution has presented its case at the trial, which began on March 28th, 2023, We've learned more details about what they believe happened to the brothers, much of which has been told by the West's surviving children. What has emerged is a tale of abuse, lies, and subterfuge helped along by the height of the COVID pandemic. Kern County Assistant District Attorney Eric Smith ended his opening statements with this. Now, during one of the interviews, and it'll be played for you here, Jacqueline West talks about how she talked to her kids about Orrin and Orson. She said, I told them, pretend they're not here. Just act like they don't live here. Just uh, go do your work. She talked about what she did with Orrin and Orson. 
I always keep them separated. I keep them separated. I focus mainly on schooling while they're playing. They don't really play together, but they have played together. I just don't know. But that's essentially what happened to Orin and Orson. They were in that home, but they were kept separate. And then ultimately, sometime in September, they were killed and have not been seen since then. Uh, during I've spoke about it. Well, there'll be a lot of surveillance footage we look at. There will be a lot of interviews that we look at. Interviews of Jacqueline, interviews of Trezell. A lot of details that we will be going over. Things that they said. Things that changed. And ultimately, the answer to the question of where are the boys will be answered. It's that they're dead. And at the end of the case, I will ask you to return a verdict of guilty beyond a reasonable doubt as to Trezell and Jacqueline for the murders of Orrin and Orson West. Thank you. So, yeah. I mean, his whole, he gives a lot of information in the open, opening statement, as you can imagine, but that is how he ended it. But that is, of course, one side of the story. The defense claims that the Wests are victims of a botched investigation in which police failed to follow up on leads and zeroed in on murder as an excuse as to why they couldn't find the boys. Trezell and Jacqueline are being represented by separate lawyers, and Jacqueline's reserved her opening statements. So Trezell's defense attorney, Timothy Hennessy, said that California City Police were wrong to assume that Orrin and Orson hadn't been abducted by strangers. He never handled this investigation like she was the mother of missing sons. This was a tragic accident, is what the evidence will show. All right? They don't have an answer for it because it was tragic. But instead, Trezell is here on a murder charge. The bottom line is Cal, Z- Cal City out the gate just never thought anyone would take two little black boys. That's why the investigation will look the way it did. This is Trezell West. This is Jacqueline West. And their two little boys are missing. Thank you. All right. So, uh... <laughs> Guy's doing some heavy breathing. Yeah. Seems yeah. real nervous. Fighting for his life up there. He references a tragic accident. Yeah, I find that interesting. Because, you know, granted, and like I said, this episode, we're not getting into the defense's case because right. they just uh, started it as of this recording. So we only kind of know about the cross-examination, but they haven't put forth, like, a ton of theories about what did happen to them. Um, and at no point that I've seen have they referenced, you know, some sort of accident at this point. Unless he was referring to an, the, an abduction as a tragic accident. Perhaps, but, yeah, because he does definitely bring that up. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's I, just a weird way to refer to, to right, it. Right, I agree. So I'll be curious to see what theories they present. Yeah, me too. So yeah, like I said, right now we're getting into the prosecution's case and testimony kicked off with police officers who initially investigated the missing persons report that Trezell called in on December 21st. The prosecution showed extensive amounts of body cam footage of both the investigation at the home and their interviews with the Wests. The big takeaway from this is that it seems as though Cal City Police suspected the Wests almost immediately. Officer Brian Hansen testified that in addition to looking for children's shoe prints in the dirt after they responded to the home, which is completely reasonable in a case where children were said to have wandered off, they also searched the West's trash cans looking for dirty diapers or other signs that children lived in the home, small children, and apparently they didn't find any. In the footage of Trezell's interrogations, both detectives and an FBI agent assigned to the case challenged Trezell's version of the story, saying that they believe he and Jacqueline know exactly where the boys are. The police also make it clear that their story does not match up with those of their other four children. So we know early on that those kids were talking and the story that they were telling did not match up with the story that their parents were telling. And do we know the ages? Of yeah. The other ones? So um, 
the I what I do know is that the oldest one at the time was 10 years old. So there are four children, oldest one was 10. He's 12 now. And they were all older than Orn and Orson, who are four and three. So we're going to, we'll just say between five and 10 for the four of them. When the defense gets their turn to cross-examine Officer Hansen, they focus on the large number of sex offenders living in the immediate area of the West's Cal City home, 42 to be exact. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, it, it, it immediately made me think of the Michael Vaughn story when I looked at the sex offenders there and there were just a ton. Hennessy asks Officer Hansen how many of those sex offenders he interviewed. Which is a very reasonable question sure. in a case like this. Yeah. Hansen says that he went to the homes of six of them, but was only ever able to speak with two. Not great. No, not fantastic. So, and you get where the, the defense is going with this and why they're kind of pushing this. Yeah, they're looking for doubt. No, absolutely. And so, yeah, we will see this as a recurring theme. Two of the West's neighbors, Jesse Dobbins and Robin Plants, also took the stand. They were basically there to testify that they had never seen Orrin and Orson, with Jesse stating that he had only ever seen three to four children in and around the home. And like when they first moved in, um, he went over to the West's house to borrow an air compressor. And so he like actually had gone to the house and said that he'd only seen three or four children. Robin was their next door neighbor and said that on the day the boys were reported missing, she looked through a hole in the fence and saw an African-American man in a gray hoodie going back and forth with wood. He eventually got into a white van. And this roughly does match Trizel's account of the day. I mean, that's his story. He had been going back and forth and gathering wood that day. And, you know, part of the problem with this, and this is another recurring theme that you will hear from the defense is that it's not suspicious that all of these people never really saw Orrin and Orson. It was the height of COVID. People weren't seeing each other. And so their position is that a lot of these situations that the prosecution is trying to make out as like suspicious are simply a byproduct of that particular time. I mean, I'll give them that to an extent, but neighbors had seen the other children. Right. But, you know, I think it's more like the ki- they, they, they were new to the neighborhood. There are a lot of kids. Maybe they didn't know which ones they had and hadn't seen. Because they didn't like nobody like really knew the family that well, you know. Uh, okay. I yeah, guess. I'm just saying that's what that's what we're getting from the defense. So I mean, far. It, se- it seems to me that you'd be able to pick out a three and a four year old. Right. Yeah. Well, and to that point, Robert Dees, the realtor who sold the West's, the Cal City home also testified. And his testimony is important because it does place one of the boys in Cal City. On September 11th, 2020, Robert went to the home to hand over the keys to the West's. While he was there, he saw Trezell, Jacqueline and several children. He testified that one of the children had what he called, quote, a mean look on his face. Trezell and Jacqueline said that he was always in a bad mood. Robert was shown a picture of Orrin and Orson and identified Orson as the boy he had seen. He said that he had not seen Orrin at the home. So according to Robert, the day they closed on their home, everyone in the family was there with the exception of Orrin. And he would have been four at this time? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously they couldn't have left him alone. I suppose in theory they could have left him with a parent, a grandparent? Yeah, no, absolutely. And we'll we'll talk about that, too, because that is the story that they gave at certain times, is that they were with, you know, other family members, right? Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, he was four years old. They were all at the house. Orson was three, and he was there, according to the realtor. The rest of the testimony on day four of the trial focused on the December 21st search. A neighbor who helped look testified, and a California Highway Patrol pilot talked about how he searched with his plane, but found no trace of the brothers. And and again, we talk about this a lot in the first episode, where 
the search started very quickly and the entire neighborhood got involved. Police got involved. Airplanes got involved. I mean, they really went after them very quickly. So if it were simply a case of the boys having wandered off, they could not have gotten that far on their own. And the fact that there was no trace of them is really what led people to be suspicious in the first place. As the prosecution began day five, they delved deeper into Jacqueline and Trizel's interviews and why they first began to become suspects. California City Police Chief Jesse Hightower was the focus. He described Jacqueline's demeanor as neutral, saying, quote, there was no frustration, no anger, no anxiety, end quote. He also asked Trizel what he thought had happened to the boys, and Trizel gave him a theory. Oren and Orson's biological parents took them. He said this scared him because of his other four sons, which like, why? Yeah. I mean, why would like, okay, sure. The biological parents are exacting revenge. They want their kids back. They're going to steal them. But like, they don't want your other four kids. (laughs) Yeah, right. That doesn't make any sense. Alexia Torres Stallings, Jacqueline's attorney, continued to try to focus on investigative shortcomings, asking Hightower if a pair of volunteers had turned in a report that they had been instructed to turn in. Hightower replied that he didn't know. I mean, what does that have to do with anything? Just showing that they, again, just weren't crossing all their T's and dotting all their I's. Because he wasn't sure whether a pair of volunteers turned in a report. Correct. All right. The next few days of the trial were filled with witnesses, including family members and neighbors, whose main purpose was to back up the prosecution's claim that the boys had not been seen by anyone since September of 2020. One of the witnesses who stated he had not seen either of the boys after the family moved to California City was Josiah West, Trezell's younger brother. Charles Pettis, Orson's biological father, took the stand to refute accusations that he had anything to do with the boy's disappearance, saying that he had never visited the West's home until after Orrin and Orson were reported missing. We see the defense. Their big case is twofold. One, the police didn't do a great job investigating. They had tunnel vision. And two, somebody else took the boys, whether it's the sex offender, whether it's the biological parents or whatever. And so we see very early on and very clearly what the prosecution is trying to do is to dismantle those theories as much as possible, saying that they have good reason to think that it was the parents who did this and not strangers, and that all of these other alternate suspects that the defense is going to bring up, like we're nipping that in the bud and we're going to bring them out first and say, no, they didn't. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good strategy. Yeah. And um, yeah. And they were very methodical about this. Um, The prosecution's case took a total of 17 days or actually 18 days, I believe. And and they were they were very methodical about laying out, you know, when every person in Orrin and Orson's life last saw them and proving that, you know, it was not after September at all. And, you know, so if it wasn't after September, then the sex offenders don't matter. Right. Because they were already missing. Right. Right. As the second week of the trial wrapped up, we began to get a glimpse into the lives of the Wests and their children. Officer Hansen said that the children's room looked like a compound with the beds barely above the floor. Trezell's father, Philip West, took the stand and was asked about this. He said that he was a Marine and that he raised Trezell with discipline. The bedroom was a reflection of that. Philip was emotional on the stand when asked about his grandchildren. As he had done with the others, the prosecutor established that Philip hadn't seen the boys for many months prior to their disappearance. Trezell's attorney, however, said that while this was true, it wasn't suspicious. It was the height of COVID, and a lot of people hadn't seen their family in months. We're just saying that over and over again. Somebody hasn't seen the boys in months. Defense says, well, yes, it was COVID. So the prosecution showed the neighbor's surveillance video from December 19th, which we talk about a lot in our original episode on this case. Yep. According to Giselle and Jacqueline, they took all of the children to Bakersfield that day, 
but the video appears to only show four children entering the van. By this point in the trial, the prosecution has also tried to hammer home that the big red flag that told them Jacqueline and Drizel were lying is the fact that their four other children said that they were. Three of them said that neither Orrin nor Orson had ever been at the Cal City home, and one said that they had only been there for a day. So, you know, this helps explain why police removed the other children from Trizel and Jacqueline's custody as quickly as they did. Right. Because this information came out almost immediately in the investigation. Not to be like, oh, we talked about this. But I mean, yeah, because the the children were removed within a day or two. And, you know, at the time, Cal City police are trying to play it off. They're like, well, you know, it's just a weird situation. And we just are worried about the kids. But it's like, how many cases have we covered where a child goes missing? Like the other children are not automatically removed <laughs> from the home. Like, yeah. No. And yeah, different jurisdictions do things differently, but right. that's not standard operating procedure at right. all. Yeah. Bakersfield police officer, John Ryan testified and some footage of his December 22nd interrogation with Jacqueline was shown to the jury. Jacqueline only gets emotional after he informs her that they're taking her other children away and tells her that the only way she can get them back is if she tells them the truth. She reiterates that the last time she'd seen the boys was the day before in the backyard. He then accuses her of lying, quote, you got new phones, you're covering up, end quote. According to Officer Ryan, Jacqueline explained that away by pointing back at the boys' biological parents saying that they, quote, didn't want the bio family calling us. We didn't want them to know our numbers, end quote. Mm, Convenient. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So Jacqueline's attorney used this as a way to further prove the defense's theory of tunnel vision, getting Officer Ryan to admit that he said things to Jacqueline, including like, you're going to lose your family and friends, your husband's going to turn on you. And that there are slim chances that someone else abducted the boys. I I don't see any problems with him saying that in an interrogation. Yeah, well, you know, I think her point is that they never treated them as grieving parents of missing children. Well, I mean, if the other kids are already saying that they're lying. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) what other direction do you want these detectives to go in? Yeah. Yeah. The defense also took another shot at investigators as it relates to that neighbor's footage from December 19th. In that footage, another neighbor is seen across the street. Torres Stallings asks Officer Ryan if he interviewed that person to see if they saw four or six kids get into the van. He said he did not. A Bakersfield Police Crime Lab supervisor and a Kern County Search and Rescue volunteer also testified and both said that nothing of great significance was turned up in a search of the West's home. And I should say there sh- there have been there had been several searches of the West's home and many items seized. Um, but yes, so their whole point is like, yeah, we actually didn't find anything super incriminating or anything like that. Because the kids weren't there. I mean, yeah. Day 11 of the trial brought the first testimony of someone who may have potentially partially witnessed what had happened to Orrin West. Maria del Carmen Noriega Salas was the West's neighbor at Casa Loma Apartments in Bakersfield. The prosecution's theory of the case is that Oren was killed prior to the Cal City move and Orson was killed shortly thereafter. Maria spoke through an interpreter and testified that on September 19th, 2020, and I'm just going to quote straight from the Bakersfield Now article here, and Bakersfield Now has been doing an excellent job of covering this case. They're in the courtroom every single day. They said, quote, she heard a loud noise at a dumpster. She went outside the apartment to look and saw Trizel and Jacqueline each carrying a handle of a 21 inch blue cooler with a white lid. Del Carmen said Jacqueline looked straight at her. The Wests walked to the curb very slowly, were speaking in English and laughing very loudly. They walked to the sidewalk, stopped and saw her again, then continued walking. She said Trizel grabbed something skinny and placed it on his shoulder. They walked to the grass area and then made a turn. Del Carmen was on the phone with a friend and Casa Loma resident, Laura Aguirre, when this was happening. End quote. So basically, her story is that she saw them 
throwing a cooler away into a dumpster together that they both had to carry. Yeah, I mean, obviously that doesn't look good for them, but it's not really super damning evidence. No, it isn't. Um, She goes on to say that, you know, she was on the phone with this friend, right? And, um, you know, she just got a weird feeling about the entire situation. So she, she says that she just like felt like there was danger. She didn't really know why. And she's talking to her friend about it. And then, you know, months later, after Orrin and Orson reported missing, her friend who she was on the phone with, like sent her an article or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, no, that's who I saw by yeah. the dumpster that day. Yeah. So at that point, she called police to tell them about this story. Well, that's good. Yeah. But during cross-examination, the defense brought up that Maria's original story to police stated that she was not able to see Jacqueline's face. Whereas in this version, she says that Jacqueline looked straight at her. And they also pointed out that, you know, she didn't know what was in the cooler and that this isn't indicative of any crime whatsoever. Right. So she says that, you know, the whole thing with like her story changing, you know, she says that maybe the, the interpreter misunderstood, you know, or something like that, because again, she's a Spanish speaker and in both her original statement to police and her court testimony, she spoke through an interpreter and they are different interpreters. Uh So she said that there could have been literally something lost in translation there. Orson's biological father, Ralph Mosley, also testified. He says that he came to California City after the boys were reported missing and, along with his wife and some friends, helped search around the West's house. He denies ever being there prior to their disappearance and denies having any involvement in their disappearance. The next day, the boy's biological mother, Ryan Dean, was called to the stand. She was also pressed about being involved in Orrin and Orson's disappearance, but for a more specific reason— An FBI agent testified that they had received a tip saying that the brothers had been cited at an apartment complex in Arlington, Texas. And Ryan Dean, weirdly, because she lives in California, happens to have an apartment in Arlington, Texas. That is strange. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, yeah, that that's definitely a weird one. But she, of course, also denies having anything to do with them going missing. She also testified that she had limited contact with the Wests because she didn't like them, basically. That is the reason, according to her, that she didn't attend her last visitation with her sons. She said that she had never been to the Bakersfield apartment and had never been to their Cal City home until after the boys were reported missing. And the defense tried to prove that she's not credible and got her to admit on the stand that she lied to the investigators early on about Orson. And so I don't know specifically what she lied about. I don't think it was anything major. Um, my guess would have it would have had to have been something related to like when she had custody of them, whether it was abuse or you know something else in the home or yeah, you know something of that nature. I don't think it was anything that was like material to their disappearance. But again, this was just more of a way to attack her credibility, right? Further testimony from criminalists and other experts seemed to work in favor of the defense, with them saying basically that they weren't able to find any murder weapons or any other incriminating evidence, either in the West's home or vehicles. So, like, for instance, there were a bunch of gardening tools that were seized and tested for blood and things like that, and nothing was found. Yeah, I mean, I can see how that might present itself as positive for the defense but it's also a positive for the theory that the prosecution is presenting that they were never actually in the home yeah so and that they had two months or three months to get rid of any potential evidence yeah at an apartment complex yeah so i mean you know if if there's no suspicion of anything happening nobody's going to go searching a dumpster for a murder weapon. Right. When, as far as anybody knows, the boys are alive and well. Right. But on day 14, the children began to testify. One of their sons testified that when they moved to Cal City, he shared a room with another adopted brother and either Orrin or Orson. 
He also testified that he doesn't remember if either of them was with the family on that December 19th trip to Bakersfield. The testimony of the sons is when this case gets truly heartbreaking. Body cam footage from the beginning of the investigation was shown, and in it, the oldest tells police that Orrin went to his mom's grandma's house, but did not know where Orson went. The other child didn't know if Orrin or Orson went to California City. He said they were not living with them anymore because they cried a lot. He said his mom and dad told him they went to live where they used to live, which is exactly what Oakley Carlson's sister said that her parents told her. Another devastating bit of testimony came from a teenager who was a former foster child of the West's from six years ago. He lived there with his two younger brothers, and it was not a good situation. He said that Jacqueline would discipline the foster children in a way that wasn't normal. When the sons would not eat, she would yell and curse at them and send them to their room. He said she would do a hold on the boys where she would wrap her legs around them and hold them from their necks with their with her arms. She would do this for hours sometimes. So like a chokehold? I guess. Video is shown of one of the children's interviews with CPS in which he says that Trizel would beat the two oldest biological children, as well as Orn and Orson, with a metal belt buckle until they bled. The eldest child also said that his parents would smack the toddlers in the face when they cried. Then, Trizel and Jacqueline's eldest son testified and told the court about the events that led to Orrin's death. He said that while they were still in the Bakersfield apartment, his parents had started blending Orrin and Orson's food and making them eat out of bottles. One evening, while their parents weren't paying attention, Orrin took Orson's bottle and drank it. When Drizelle and Jacqueline found out, they told Orson to punch Orrin for taking his bottle. He did. The oldest son said that he heard Orrin making noises in bed that night. They all shared a room but that he often heard noises coming from the kids, so he didn't really think anything of it. The next morning, he saw his parents try to wake Orrin up, but they realized he had choked on his own vomit and died during the night. He testified that they told him if they called 911 that he and his brothers would get taken away, so they made him promise not to tell anyone. He said he didn't know what happened to Orrin after that. He didn't ask his parents, and they didn't tell him. Fuck. So he gets punched by his older brother. Younger. His younger brother. And then he vomits in the middle of the night and aspirates and dies. That's what it sounds like. And all of the kids were in the room when it happened. But of course, they're kids. They didn't know what was going on. I read in another source, like the older brother did testify with a little bit more detail and said that like he saw, you know, Orrin's face turning white, and um, then yeah, he went on to testify that Orson did make the move with them later that month to Cal City. But one night, shortly after they moved in, he heard what he described as a soap bottle dropping in the bathroom. After that, he never saw Orson again. The child is basically the prosecution's star witness, and I can't imagine the trauma that he's had to endure or how difficult it was for him to get up and tell his story in front of his parents. As the prosecution wound down, they worked on reiterating their position that no one had seen the boys for months prior to the reported disappearance on December 21st. Trizel's mother, Wanda, testified via Zoom that she came to their new home in Cal City on September 18th to watch the children while Trizel and Jacqueline took a U-Haul back to Bakersfield to move over more of their belongings. She said that she only watched the four older sons and that she had been told that Orrin and Orson were with Jacqueline's mother. She stayed at the home until September 20th as Trizel and Jacqueline went back and forth and said that she never saw either of the toddlers. They moved in on September 11th and the realtor said, that he had seen Orson, but not Orin. Right. And by one week later, the 18th, both of them were gone. Jacqueline's mother previously testified that she did not watch Orin and Orson at all in September of 2020. 
Jacqueline herself was seen on video during a July 1st, 2021 interview saying that when Wanda was watching the older boys in September, the little ones were with her and Trizel. She Wait, say that again? She, she said that they were with her? No, Jacqueline said that she had the kids. So basically, Wanda's saying, Wanda's Trizel's mother. So Trizel's mom is saying that when she went to babysit the kids in September, right after they bought the house, that it was only the four older ones. Right. And they said, oh, the little ones are with Jacqueline's mom. Jacqueline's mom said, I never watched any of the kids in September. And then in July of 2021, seven months after the boys were reported missing, Jacqueline tells police during an interview that when Wanda was watching the kids, she only watched the four kids because she and Trizel had the little ones. Oh, okay. So all of these stories are contradicting each other. Right. The prosecution closed its case with the testimony of a Texas man who had been the subject of the tip saying the boys had been seen in Arlington. He denied knowing either of them or having anything to do with their disappearance. Ending their case with Jacqueline seemingly getting caught in a lie along with their surviving children's testimony certainly puts the prosecution in a strong position. The defense has started presenting their case, however, uh, as of this recording, so we will bring you more updates on that as well. According to the judge, the defense could rest their case as early as May 17th, so we will continue to follow this as well as bringing the verdict when it's in. Anyone who has any information on the disappearance of Orrin and Orson West or people who have any interactions with the boys at all in the year 2020 is urged to contact the California City Police Department at 760-373-8606. To remain anonymous, you can call the secret witness line at 661-322-4040. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. Our research writing and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. The music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!